I just drove 2,000 miles to film your most requested video. Hey guys, welcome back to Build Something Cool. Today, I'm gonna to talk about how to buy a milling machine. But before we can do that, we have to find one. Well, I was talking to my friend Jason over at Fireball Tools and he said, hey Dale, I've got the perfect milling machine for you. Problem is, it's in Spokane, Washington, and I'm here in San Francisco. So it's about a 2,000 mile round trip, but well worth it. So I'm gonna take you on the adventure up to Spokane, visit Jason, and show you the whole process to buying a milling machine and checking it out. Hey Jason, good to see you again. Welcome to the shop, Dale. Thank you. So this is the machine I just drove a thousand miles for. Yes. What's its history? I ran the numbers. This is a 1991 Bridgeport knee mill. This machine's pretty unique. The business that this came out of, they did light manufacturing, but they also employed handicapped and disabled. So I think it's utterly awesome. And this machine came out of the maintenance department of that facility. So this thing's in perfect shape? Oh, I wouldn't say it about perfect. Worth, was it worth me driving a thousand miles for? I think so. All right. Because uh, they're just hard to find in a just general clean condition anymore. It's just, they don't come up on Craigslist very often. So I think this might be a good candidate for you. Excellent. All right, guys, so we're gonna test this out. Jason's gonna go do some stuff for yep. Fireball Tool. Oh, hold on, hold on. Come back here a minute. Yes. You promised me advice for this. I got you covered. Stay right here. All right. <laughs> I think I got you covered, Dale. You can pick anyone out of this basket. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know if you guys know, but Jason did a whole video on destroying vices. When you're talking to somebody, you need to be very clear when you say you want a new vice, or a vice comes with it, that it's in good shape. I know the biggest fear in buying a new machine is it going to be worth the value. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to go through this entire mill. We're going to check it out, and I want to talk about how you want to ascertain or how you want to figure out, is this a good mill for the work that you need to do? No matter what, there's always wear on a milling machine. You just have to determine how much wear you want. You've just found your machine, you found it on Craigslist, you give the guy a call. Hello? What kind of questions do you want to ask? Well, you want to ask, how long has he owned it? How long did he use it? How did he use it? And the best way to check it out is actually show up to the guy's shop and go through it. So I put together a little toolkit of things I can bring to the location so I can actually check out the quality of the machine. So I always bring a dial indicator on a stand. I bring a square. I also bring screwdrivers and all sorts of little things. So if I need to take something off or t take it apart, I do. There's basically four types of people who are gonna buy a milling machine. You have your tool and die guy. He wants one as though it just came off the factory floor. The third guy is the machinist. Now, He's going to be really particular because he's going to use this every day, all day long. And he's after a certain quality, but he doesn't need to have the highest quality like the tool and die guy. Then there's us guys, the home machinists. We want to get the best machine we can. And we want to get as tight as we can, but we don't want to pay five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 for it. We want to find it at a more reasonable price. Then you have your fabricator, your welder, that kind of guy. Really what he wants to be able to do is just cut a slot or drill a series of holes really accurate. So the standard that he needs is, as long as the motor runs, it's good. There's a real skill to taking a look at a machine because you have to remember the owner of the machine is standing right next to you most of the time. And you don't wanna stress him out, you don't wanna make him worried because there's a lot of things you're gonna do. So there's certain things I like to do when I look at a machine. I like to do the simplest things first and then I start getting in a little more detailed, a little more detailed. So that's what we're gonna do first. We just kind of take a general look at the machine. What shape is it in? Is it clean? Now sometimes a dirty machine isn't a bad deal, okay? Um, when it's clean, sometimes they might be trying to hide something. So just take a look at it. What shape is the paint in? Is it reasonable? Usually this area here will be all chipped up because of the chips flying off. You wanna look up into this area here. What's it look like? Um, here's a really great example. These aren't the original nuts, or they've been abused in some way. This, I'm not worried about. This is really common to have a little bit of wear on these. So when you turn these handles, what you're really looking for is does it get tight? So we're here in the center. When we come all the way to the end here, if it starts getting tight, we're starting to see signs of wear. Same thing with this here, same with the knee. 
we want to see how much wear there is. Now, like I said before, no matter what, there's always wear on a milling machine. You just have to determine how much wear you want. So you want to be aware of when you're looking at a mill, is it the size that you can go? Now, a lot of guys want to go, I want a big table. Well, the problem is when you get to a big table, this one here is actually the larger table, this is the 48, you end up having to reach too far to use the handles that far out. There's actually four different table sizes. There's a 32, a 36, a 42, and a 48. So you also have different size motors. This particular one has a two horse motor on it. I think it came in as a one and a half and a a two and a three. Now, if you're looking at one of these that's not a bridge port, it's a Chinese version or a Taiwan version. I had one that actually had a two-speed motor. So it was a step with a two-speed motor. So that meant I got a total of 16 speeds off that. So it was really a very convenient machine to use. So now we want to see what type of accessories came with because that also kind of changed the price. This one here has a DRO with it. It also has the original Bridgeport power feeds, not just the X but also the Y. This is a very rare box. This is worth a little bit of money. So we will want to run these through. We'd give it a try. So this is a rapid traverse. We can check the speed. We can slow it way down, speed it up, back to rapid traverse. So you see how that sounds? The power was consistent. The sound was consistent going both ways. One of the great things about this milling machine, it comes with a DRO. DRO stands for digital readout. So these scales actually will change with the table moving. Now, it used to be a big advantage to getting a DRO with the milling machine because they used to be so expensive. But now you can go onto eBay, get glass scales, which glass scales are the best scales that, for reading because they don't change or they don't expand with temperature. You can get one of those setups for a bridge fort for around 200, 250 bucks. So this is great to have on it because I don't have to install it. But at the end of the day, it really doesn't add that much value to the milling machine. Now the next thing was we want to determine, we've already looked at the whole machine and we're going, okay, this is worth looking into deeper. So now we want to look actually at the waves. And you'll see on the waves, they have these little half moons. And these are actually where the oil is able to settle in, so there's always a film of oil kept between the waves. Now, does the pattern stay the same? If it's starting to get thinner and thinner, well, we have some wear. But like I said, wear's not bad, no matter what level you want to work at. We can also look at the table. This table here is in beautiful shape. We have that same pattern up here. It's consistent across the top. We don't have any mill marks. Nobody's like, you know, crashed this. It's really in excellent, excellent shape. Next thing you want to look at, you want to take a look at the dials. What kind of shape are the dials in? Can you read them? The next thing we want to check, we want to check the quill. And like I said, I've never found the outside of the quill to be worn or damaged, but you still want to lower it down and take a look because if it is, this is not a repairable part. If this is loose, you don't have a milling machine, you have a drill press. Before you put the collet in first, you want to reach in here and you want to see what kind of condition this is in. If there's any rust or pitting, that's a sign that this machine possibly wasn't stored correctly and there may be other parts that are rusty. This one here is in really nice shape, but I'm gonna tell you, I actually had one that had some rust in here. And all I did is I took some rust removal, put it on a rag, stuffed it in there, came back a couple hours later, it's in perfect shape, had no problems at all. What I'm feeling for now when I'm going with this, tightening this up, is it gritty? How's that feel? So this feels really, really nice. That is solid. Up here we have the variable speed head. So this head's making a little bit of noise. That doesn't worry me because that's just more of a maintenance issue. Down here is where the problem is. We can't replace these parts, but we can replace these. So let's give it a try and see how it works. This is now spinning. We should be able to click this. There we go. This one's a little stiff, but now we can see the quill handle's moving. 
We have three speeds. We want to check all three. I'm not hearing any grinding. Everything's working. If I wanted to, I could have this run all the way down and see if it automatically returns. I know that since this is working, I can get the automatic return or the automatic stop to work without a problem. It's usually just something sticky in the levers here. So this, this is good. This is great. The quill is great. Let's try the back gear. So that's really solid. Now, what I was listening for was there a change in the sound of the motor and everything up there. No changes. So that is excellent. There's nothing to worry about there. We're going to check the run out now on this milling machine. And the challenge here is this is locked in, so it's hard to spin. We're going to actually come up here to the back gear and disengage it, and that'll give us the free flow to test this. We're moving about two to three tenths, which is excellent. We should be out about two tenths at the most. That run out, the problem could be the way the collets fit in. This is actually a Chinese collet, so there could be some error there. There could be a little bit in the pin, but we're showing some just excellent numbers right there. Next, we're going to do actually physically test it. We're going to run this all the way in and out, and we want to see how it feels. That if it gets really stiff at the ends, well, that is telling us that there's a lot more wear in the center. This one here, of course, is excellent. These ways are really consistent. You can take a look at an example at the front and the back to see what it should look like, and then see if it compares the same way in the middle. Our next challenge here is we want to find out how much wear there might be in this machine. And we're going to start out with a dial indicator because if we're finding a lot of wear, we want to determine how much there is. And we can measure some of it, but that's not always the best way to do it. We need to actually do a physical test. We're going to bring it up against the gauge. Now, when we move this, we should see, oh, that's funny. <laughs> so here's what's funny. This, this system is so smooth. So I'm bumping up against it and looking at the, uh, the indicator. And the indicator keeps moving a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. It's because this is such a smooth system. I'm actually pushing the whole table and the screw's turning a little bit, allowing it to move. Right now, we're getting actually quite a bit of movement here. We're getting about 2,000. So we're a little sloppy here, but I'm not too worried about it because we'll actually tighten up the Gibbs and test it again. Now, we're also dealing with, we have the Gibbs here that are moving, and we also have the Gibbs from the X moving. So let's take this, we're going to lower it down, and now we're just going to test the Gibbs on the wide, on the Y axis, and we're getting about two thousandths there, so that's really good. But I feel we can actually tighten up these Gibbs and get just a little bit more accuracy out of them. So now, so now here's things people ignore a lot, is checking the Z. So we're going to actually see if it's square. We're going to bring in our machine of square here. And we're going to simply just use, we have a shim here that's a 1,000th, and that's about what we want. If this is a tight machine at 12 inches, that's about when this should come into contact in the gap. See, that's really good. Let's tighten up the table. That's nice. Now, if this was a little sloppy or it didn't measure out, the problem is we need to tighten up the Gibbs and check it, but you'll also find out that this will also have wear probably more in the center or in one area than any place else. So as you're inspecting this machine, take a look at the screw. Now, you're going to have a hard time seeing if the screw is worn out five thousandths, ten thousandths. But if you can tell there's a difference between the threads here and here, the threads have gotten thinner, you can do a quick visual inspection to determine what shape the screw is in. Backlash in the screw is really important to understand. Now, we do have a DRO on this, and that'll help cancel it out. But we want to find out how much wear there is. Is there wear actually in the nut, or is it actually in the screw? And the screw is probably more worn in the center than it is on the edge. But we want to check what it is on both ends and then the center and do a comparison. With that, we'll know what kind of condition the screw's actually in and probably the rest of the machine. We're going to zero out the needle. We're going to zero out the handle here. Actually, we're going to give it just a little preload. And then we're going to turn this one full revolution. And then we're going to come back to zero and see what the difference is. OK, went back to zero. Identical here as it is here. So we have no problems with the screw in the center. Now, if I wanted to, 
Because I got no backlash here, that means we probably have nowhere in the screw, but what I would normally do is check this end and that end and then compare it, but we are rocking on this machine. But let's say we had a little bit of slop here. Let's say we had about 10 thousandths out. We want to be around, let's say, three to five thousandths. We can come in here, we can actually adjust this nut because it's a split nut. You can actually clamp that together and get a little tighter fit on the screw. So we tighten it up here so it moves nice and smooth and get rid of the backlash. Check it on this end, see if it's consistent. If the screw's worn, we've actually helped it out a lot on the ends, but we'll still have a little bit of slop here, but it's gonna be a lot better in the end. The last question we wanna answer is, how much do you wanna spend on a milling machine? So I've kind of broke it down into four categories. We have your fabricator, which he's your kind of your welder guy that needs to just cut some slots and some steel, drill some holes accurately. You don't need to spend that much money. You can spend a thousand to less on a milling machine. The next guy I call it the home machinist. And he wants something that can do some really good work, but, but you know, you get a little willing to have a few problems with the machine. I would say the price of that machine is worth about 1,000 to 2,000. Next, you have your machinist. This is the guy that's gonna be on the machine every day. You know, he should spend two to 3,000. And then you have the top of the list, the tool and die guy which I classify this one as a, for the tool and die guy because it's such a tight, perfect machine. So we're showing you how we load it up and put it in a U-Haul trailer. And I gotta tell you guys something about U-Hauls is they do have weight limits. There's another video I did on moving machinery and I moved from Atlanta, Georgia to San Francisco last year and I had five flat tires because I overloaded. So we actually divided the milling machine up into two spaces. We took the bulk of the milling machine, put it in the trailer, the trailer can handle about 1,800 pound capacity and take the head off of it. The head's probably about two to 300 pounds and we put that in the back of the truck to just help kind of balance out the weight so I wouldn't get any more flat tires. I also want you to go check out Jason at Fireball Tools. We did a shop tour together and his shop is, I, I said somebody had a great comment on it. It's not a shop, it's Disneyland for men. All right guys, till next time, go out in your shop, and build something cool. Thanks.